questions in the comments and these will be collected and passed on. So uh, let's let's get to it, shall we? Um, the uh, our, our featured speaker today uh, is Nargis Kasyanova. Uh, Nargis is one of the co-founders of Caps Unlock mm -hmm. and is also a senior fellow and director uh, of the program on Central Asia at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Colleagues, if you're not currently speaking, I'd, I would encourage you to mute. Um, her research focuses on Central Asian politics and security, Eurasian geopolitics, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and governance in Central Asia. Uh, she is also on the steering committee of the OSC Network of Think Tanks and Academic Institutions, and on the editorial boards of a number of publications uh, of relevance to the region, among a great many, uh, a great many other things. Uh, we also will have two discussants uh, today. One, the first, uh, Dr. Stefan Meister, who is the head of the Center for Order and Governance in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia at uh, at uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations, uh, that is uh, Degap, uh, our our, our co-organizer, co-host of this event. Um, and uh, Dr. Iskander Abulayev, uh, who is currently a visiting professor at Giessen University. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah has extensive experience in uh, areas such as water management, water institutions, and environmental activities in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Uh, also, this is, is not a full list of, of all of either uh, of our, our participants' uh, qualifications, um, which are, are many and impressive, but in the interests of time, um, let's, uh, I think it's, it's best to move to the, uh, to the main event. So, uh, I think we will do the following. Uh, Nargis, um, I'm thinking maybe if you could aim for 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll that will leave us with time uh, for comments um, by Stefan uh, and Iskandar, and we'll try to get that uh, as close to the top of the hour as possible in order to leave as much time as we can for uh, the Q&A. But um, Nargis, then, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Michael, and I, I apologize profusely for not being able to um, to to join the uh, to join the call. I was trying <laughs> hard, um, and uh, yeah, the the, the 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 trial, as Aida mentioned, we we did we did have a check and it was so deceivingly easy that this time um, it was a big surprise. But anyhow, anyhow, um, let me share my screen. Can you see? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So before uh, before I start um, uh, my my presentation, which I will try to uh, compress, um, in the interest of time, since we started since we started late, I wanted to thank uh, to thank three people um, who helped me. Uh, Think, think through it and who helped me to improve the text. And that's uh, Iskander Abdullayev, who is a panelist today, and um, Harvey Salgo, and also Marsha uh, magro Olev. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for your help. But all the weaknesses of the paper, obviously, are uh, fully, uh, fully mine. Okay. So uh, the title of my policy memo is Strategic Autonomy for Central Asia, Drawing Inspiration and Support from the European, Mo uh, European Union. And I drew my inspiration for the paper from, uh, from the uh, remarks made by uh, Joseph Borrell uh, in Samarkand in October 2022 at the uh, EU Central Asia Connectivity Conference. And he said, like our partners in Central Asia, uh, we too um, in Europe see the need to advance our strategic autonomy. And uh, that raised some questions uh, in, in my head. Uh, is Central Asia advancing strategic autonomy? Um, Central Asians and Central Asianists know that we don't really use this concept in, uh, in the region. Uh, when autonomy is mentioned, it's usually an autonomous republic. Um, to describe strategic positioning, we uh, we use the uh, the concept of multi-vector uh, foreign policy. Also, we talk about diversification, and there is a well-established discourse on the benefits of uh, of regional cooperation. But we don't talk in terms of uh, in terms of strategic uh, strategic autonomy, and um, 
and I thought, should we get a cue from from uh, Borel? Should we uh, should we feel the need for strategic autonomy? Should we uh, start thinking in these terms? And the more I thought about it, the more I was convinced that yes, uh, we should. And um, this concept has the potential to to guide us, um, to guide Central Asians, provide vision, helps us address pressing uh, pressing challenges and uh, looming threats, and. Uh, and yes, uh, the EU and Central Asia can can partner in their search for uh, for strategic uh, strategic autonomy. Um, I'll in my little presentation I'll follow the structure of uh, of the memo um, and uh, well say a couple of words about the current moment. Um, and the current moment, of course, the predominant kind of thing is the war Russia's war in uh, in Ukraine. Um, then say a couple of words about the EU strategic autonomy debate, um, then um, the trajectory and the current state of Central Asian regionalism, and then move on to my uh, to my proposals to adopt the concept and how to uh, how to move forward, uh, drawing inspiration and support uh, from uh, from the European Union. Well, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, of course, it's a very big thing. It's a major blow to, blow to the European security architecture. It's a major blow to the Eurasian political uh, political order. Um, and uh, well, Europe has a war in you know the center of Europe, and uh, for uh, and for us, uh, Russia's land grab in uh, in Ukraine viola violates the uh, the post-Soviet order as cornerstone, the unavailability of uh, uh, territorial uh, integrity and existing existing borders, uh, which is a principle enshrined in the 1991 um, Almaty Declaration adopted this, by the CIS states when the CIS was um, was founded. And um, the land grab is accompanied by the rhetorical neg negation of Ukraine's sovereignty, which uh, which of course instills fear in other. Uh, post-Soviet states, and maybe here I can note that unlike for the global South, it is our war. It is, you know, it is European war, but it's also uh, a war that directly uh, affects uh, affects us. Uh, plus, we're facing um, ge geoeconomic ruptures, decoupling efforts triggered by growing geopolitical rivalries. And the, amid the weaponization of trade and finance, Central Asia is uh, is caught in the in the middle. Um, I think you know the the uh, the examples of this. Uh, so as a result of these upheavals, both Europeans and Central Asians are facing an extremely uh, serious challenge, and they need to rethink. They need to rethink ways to ensure their security. Um, well-being, find a new mode of living with Russia, adjust their the relations with uh, uh, with um, other actors, and the obvious policy to pursue is diversification and decoupling to lessen dependence on the unpredictable and dangerous uh, dangerous countries. And they kind of and that that creates more grounds for partnership between EU and Central Asia. Um, the Europeans want to tap into Central Asian uh, kind of resources. And uh, Central Asians also need uh, uh, need more ties with Europe, uh, trade, investments, and so on. Uh, and um, and uh, well, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, especially, are pushing for the development of the middle uh, middle corridor across the Caspian Sea to connect the regions. Now. I will not go into details uh, here um, on the EU uh, strategic autonomy debate. Let me just uh, um, quote the European Council conclusions um, from December 2013 document. Uh, strategic autonomy is capacity to act autonomously to safeguard its interests, uphold its values and the way of life. Um, uh, and uh, and help shape the global, uh, future. So, uh, well, the uh, this uh, this debate uh, has been going on for about uh, about ten years, um, and uh, there are two main facets. One is security and defense, and here the discussion is about the autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the United States and um, 
and Europeans have both fear of abandonment and, and entrapment. If you want, we can go into this. And there is the economic uh, facet. And here uh, there was a big discussion about the autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the, the successive dependence of, uh, of, uh, of Europe on, um, on Russian uh, well, gas, yes, particularly. Um, and then the the kind of the second uh, the second big uh, rival is uh, is China. China has been expanding globally, and uh, Europeans are increasingly thinking about the security of supply chains. And here we uh, hear about French shoring, near shoring, um, and um, and it, it creates these tensions between kind of the uh, the desire to uh, secure oneself and the kind of the need and the imperative of having open open trade so the, the term here is open strategic autonomy so it's sort of balancing or balancing protectionism with uh, with openness and um also with, with the connected to china and connected to central asia there is this uh, discussion of connectivity how to foster connectivity in uh between europe and asia and as you know european union uh, launched the global uh, gateway initiative once again it's a big topic i will not go into into this here but we can discuss it during the q and now um central asia what's been happening in uh, central asia over the past uh, uh three decades since we became independent. We're a fairly new region. Um, and uh, while we have certain legacies, so Soviet legacy, uh, we inherited poorly defined borders. We, we inherited some shared infrastructure, uh, joint water management, energy, transport system. Uh, and this legacy created both centripetal and centrifugal tendencies. And um, and we see sort of that the centrifugal tendencies have been stronger so far. Uh, and here I also want to kind of share the observation that centripetal trends seem to strengthen in times of existential fear and acute geopolitical uncertainty. So the strongest push we saw at the beginning of the 1990s when it wasn't clear what's happening um, in the region, with the region, uh, that's when uh, the, the when uh, Tashkent and... Um, Almata at the time tried to uh, create a central Central Asian um, Union. So, so there were ups and downs, uh, and now we are sort of in a at a well fairly good point. Uh, there was a change of tide uh, with the change of uh, uh, with the change of president in um, in Uzbekistan. So. Um, as we know, uh, President Mirziyoyev you know, wants to uh, wanted to open the country to have better relations uh, with neighbors. And uh, in 2017, at the UN General Assembly, uh, he uh, he emphasized uh, his country's readiness to make reasonable compromises with the neighboring countries. Uh, and he proposed to uh, to hold regular consultation uh, consultation meetings, and they did take place. Um, four times already, and the, the last one was in Cholponata in uh, in summer. It was July 20, 2022, and um, and that was uh, well a pretty good uh, pretty good meeting. The presidents signed several agreements, um, including roadmap for the development of regional cooperation, regional green agenda program. Unfortunately, not available. To, to the public and also three countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, signed the Treaty of Friendship, Good Neighborliness and, and uh, Cooperation. Uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan said that they will um, sign later. We'll see. But it's, it seems we are in kind of, it's an upward, uh, um, upward threat. And uh, if you read the, yes, uh, if you read the um, the speeches uh, in Cholponata, oh, the 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 presidents emphasized kind of the the, the this crisis that um, that we see in in the in the broader region and it's a you know it's a dangerous moment we need to stick together sort of that's the um, uh, th that's the, the kind of what the the what motivates them and um, and that's one um, one I would say uh, factor. 
um, that creates this window of opportunity that we have now. So there is this new sense of purpose. Uh, there is the um, alignment uh, of Astana and Tashkent. And I think that's that's the axis we, we need if we want to move forward. Um, uh, also, Central Asian politics and economies are significantly different from what we had three decades ago. They're more consolidated. They're closer to the equilibrium of self-sufficiency and interdependence. Um, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan um, can now serve as locomotives of investment and trade regionalization. And um, also heavyweight external actors are actively supporting regional cooperation and the European Union is, uh, is among them. Um, so strategic autonomy for Central Asia. Can, uh, can this regional cooperation push that we see now constitute a search for strategic autonomy? I would say yes, it is still undefined and inarticulate, but it is pointing in the right direction. Uh, Central Asia is an emerging region rather than a well-formed region uh, like, like Europe. However, they, they should not, this should not disqualify Central Asia from the pursuit uh, of strategic autonomy, but I would say it should make it more meaningful and consequential. Now, um, uh, the inspiration from the uh, from the EU part can the EU serve uh, serve as an example, um, and well, uh, first uh, the kind of if we look historically, um, you, we know that European integration project is the child of two wars, and the European integration was pursued to kind of uh, to prevent this future uh, future conflicts. Um, Central Asia, if in this regard, is more fortunate in the sense that uh, we haven't had full-fledged um, interstate wars. Uh, there are no strong animosities to overcome. However, the potential con for conflict is present uh, and might grow given, given the border disputes we have and you know the regular clashes of the uh, Kyrgyz-Tajik border, for example. There is rising nationalism, there are shrinking water resources. So it is really not hard to imagine uh, kind of a future scenario where the region is ridden with armed violence and humanitarian, um, humanitarian crisis. Um, we can imagine a less dramatic negative scenario where the centrifugal tendencies uh, will grow, like there will be simmering distrust, occasional small-scale uh, conflicts. And um, and in this in this scenario, our fragmented region will become even more susceptible to pressures and manipulations from uh, from outside. That's something I think we should really keep uh, keep in mind. So I would say that the clear-headed pursuit of security, resilience and autonomy, uh, would make regional community building a political project in Central Asia. And that's one of the main kind of uh, points that I, I wanted to make with, uh, with my memo is that just regional cooperation kind of for the sake of this and that benefit is not enough, uh, that we should, um, we should elevate it uh, um, to, the, uh, to the level of a political project. So um, the the European the European uh, integration started with the uh, coal and steel community with the creation of the coal and steel community, uh, and that that was the nucleus of uh, of the European project. Uh, and it seems it seems to me that will be quite kind of if we look for this uh, nucleus in for Central Asian um, integration cooperation integration. Integration. Let, let, I'm a bit afraid of this word, but uh, if we uh, look for, for for this kind of the core, it should be water and energy, since water energy nexus has the greatest potential both to divide and unite the region. Um, and here there are the uh, kind of the four four points I I, I made. Water is unevenly distributed, uh, growing scarce due to climate change. And the rivalry over access to water can trigger conflicts among among the um, the states of the region. Water provides electricity in upstream countries, feeds agricultural fields in downstream countries, and um, well, so it's crucial for Central Asia's energy and uh, uh, food security. Um, the 
Ongoing energy transition would greatly benefit from a regional framing and pulling together resources. Hydropower and natural gas can balance this kind of the skilled up intermittent energy resources such as solar and wind. And Central Asia is a resource rich region. So it can actually, it can work. It can work very nicely as a region you know, in, in, in this regard if we can actually uh, pull our act together. Um, and investments are badly needed to develop energy systems and it would be easier to attract them <clears throat> to a secure and well-functioning well -functioning region. So I think there is a strong rationale for, for more cooperation and an attempt to, uh, to have something bigger, stronger. So uh, what kind of I could come up um, with the help of uh, with the help of some friends uh, is uh, is this structure um, sort of it is inspired by what uh, what uh, Europeans um, Europeans had but uh, but it's different because our circumstances are are different. Um, if we had some a political body, the Council of Ministers that would serve as a political umbrella of the project and platform for aligning national and regional interests and also the commission. And the commission would be uh, kind of our variant of the high authority that the European coal and steel uh, community community had. But we need to be careful, you know, kind of with the uh, how much supranational powers uh, um, we can invest it with because we are not that the uh, well our circumstances are different and I, I think it's important to be kind of to be realistic visionary and realistic at the same time. Um, so I, I would see this commission is composed of highly skilled and experienced professionals with regional interest at heart, um, which would be a heavy lifting and uh, which uh, and they would do the heavy lifting and the list um, the list of the functions will probably evolve over time. And here I put put together a list of uh, um, a list of functions kind of that I see it might actually uh, be in charge of. And that's collecting and aggregating data on water management, energy systems and climate change, developing and promoting a regional policy for modernization and better interconnection of the member states' energy and water infrastructure. So kind of uh, developing uh, a regional regulatory framework and commercial dispute resolution mechanisms, developing a regional risk assessment and crisis management mechanisms, spearheading and facilitating the planning and deployment of transboundary energy projects, including storage, and facilitating investments in any agreed energy water project by certifying their compliance with international standards. Um, that's that's a lot. Uh, the good thing is that uh, we um, it can draw the development of of the community can draw in the experience of the existing mechanisms. And here I have them uh, I have them um, enlisted. Um, and I would argue that the deep integration in a particular sector uh, approach could uh, quicken other regional cooperation schemes, but should not depend on them. And I would say that under, under the current circumstances, aiming for any regional security alliance or um, economic uh, integration project is, uh, is premature. Uh, at the same time, if we keep the current pace and modus operandi, uh, we will not have uh, substantial results and the clock is ticking and the uh, the new climate change related challenges are um, looming. So if we can pull it off, then we can have this positive, uh, very positive scenario where uh, Central Asian states can effectively pull their resources. They can ensure their energy security, food security, political security. They can reduce conflict potential and vulnerabilities to external pressures and manipulations. They can jointly mitigate climate change and firmly embark on a sustainable development path. They can make Central Asian economies attractive attractive for foreign investments, very, very important. Uh, they can export electricity to generate revenues and they can become, and Central Asia can become a region respected internationally and inspiring other, um, other regions uh, 
around the world. It's very kind of pie in the sky scenario. And uh, to um, to make it come true uh, would require a lot of uh, vision, political will, skill. Um, uh, and uh, of course, we'll deal with uh, the challenges of negotiating a regional integration mechanisms. Uh, there will be domestic pressures, external pressures, um, need to overcome various narrow interests and so on. And the key here is to select the right people, um, highly capable and region, region, um, region minded. And since it is an exercise in strategic autonomy, I think it's important that the project should not be donor driven. Um, but led by by the regions uh, regions government, but of course partnerships with the EU, partnerships with other uh, donors uh, would be extremely extremely valuable and um, indispensable. So, okay. I, guess, I think apologies, yeah. but yeah, in, uh, it's the uh, last one. Yeah. So okay, great, uh, I think that that uh, we can help each other. We should help each other, and. Um, and um, here maybe I, you, you can you can read so kind of well Europe can benefit from what we have we can benefit from what uh, Europe uh, can uh, can offer um, but I think more is needed um, and I, I think it's important to for the EU to um, to kind of understand what is Central Asia's role in EU regionalization efforts in Eurasia, its consolidation as a global power, uh, and could this partnership expand beyond the assistance to the neighbors of, of neighbors and the transactional minerals for investments uh, uh, investments uh, scheme. Um, and uh, well, and here you can you can read the kind of <laughs> the, the the argument that um, I'm I'm putting forward. Um, well, I think stronger EU support and economic corridor to Europe would help the region maintain its balancing act, and the unit stone would receive a belt of strategic partners extending from its border to the um, to the heart of um, of Asia. And let me well, and I can stop here. Okay, many thanks, Nargis. Uh, so I think um, we are, we are indeed at the top of the hour. So uh, Stefan Iskandar, I would I would uh, encourage you to keep your uh, comments to, let's say, maximum five minutes each. Um, I will give Nargis maybe a, a quick chance um, if we can sort of boil it down to to, to a, one or two sort of key questions uh, for to give Nargis the right of response, um, and then open uh, two questions in in the remaining time. So uh, Stefan, to you first. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagis, for the paper. I really, I really liked it. I found it inspiring, and I think especially in these these times where everything is changing, um, where where we really heading for also re new regional orders um, in in the in the collapsing empire. And I think Central Asia will also have its its in a way its new regional order. I think it's really important to think beyond uh, the paradigm we 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 had until now. And I think this this um, strategic autonom autonomy concept, I think, is is for me uh, very inspiring. Uh, for also against the background, increasing interest in balancing Russia and China um, uh, in the region. Um, and I, I also like this approach of focusing uh, on on where are common interests um, in the region. So I think it's on water, the water and energy nexus in Central Asia. I think is for all countries very relevant. Um, uh, and um, and I think there is something to cooperate. Yeah. So where where are really direct benefits also for. Uh, for the for the for the countries and also to have this this idea with the European coal and steel community, I think it's a it's a so as a comparison is a original um, um, idea. Um, so I think there is a kind of interest I think in the region or in the uh, of the countries to have more autonomy, to be more strategic and have more autonomy also from the other players. And I I think that's that's something I think really to to think about, um, but. For the discussion, I, I just wanted to to make some maybe some questions, also also some critical points I, I see, and and focus on this. And uh, I think uh, you can enjoy the paper also in in, in reading it. So my first point would be, um, I think it's a, 
it's very different geopolitical and security environment in Central Asia uh, than in Europe. Um, so I think uh, it's it's really a different uh, environment. We have two main players with Russia and China, which interact with each uh, with, with each other and have an interest in cooperative hegemony. That means they, they agree that they both can dominate the region, but will not allow third powers, especially Western, uh, like the EU, to be more active in the region. So there, there, there is this kind of, I think there's this kind of specific uh, constellation, let's call it like this, uh, in the region. And um, as I wrote in my paper also, you can see it with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, how they interact with each other, how they see the Central Asia as a testing ground also for their relationship. Um, uh, and uh, and they both have their, their also their own institutional framework uh, to lock in also the, the, the countries of the region and have their own bilateral relations. So I think there is already a kind of a framework, yeah, which is active, uh, where the countries have also agreed on, have have um, also the, uh, signed in. Um, and uh, and I think that that will that will somehow that works somehow against this concept. Let's let's call it like this. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think we also have to, uh, we have to understand that there are hedging strategies also from the countries in the region, but um, that means also there's an interest in cooperating and benefiting, for instance, from Russia. I think we can see it now um, with the with the war in uh, in in in, in, uh, in Ukraine. I think how Central Asian countries also benefit, for instance, uh, from circumventing sanctions, also from trade. Yeah, uh, so I think that's 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 uh, that's another uh, issue. So I think then the second point for me is <clears throat> Central Asia. Is it really a region um, uh, which really functions? I think it never really functioned. I think it's something which also was created from outside in a way. <clears throat> and um, and uh, and I think it's it's a question if there is really an interest from all from the countries to 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 more integrate and to more cooperate with each other. Besides this institutional framework with Horizon Economic Union, um, CSDO with Russia, and and S um, SCO. The third point is what I miss uh, in the analysis is the fundamental differences in the governance systems. If you compare European Union countries and Central Asian countries, all Central Asian countries are authoritarian states or at least hybrid systems uh, on, the, on the way to become more authoritarian uh, also, unfortunately. Uh, I think the trend with the war in Ukraine is more control and regime stability. Authoritarian states never give up sovereignty. I think that's this is against the logic of authoritarianism, uh, like EU member states and more uh, democratic states are doing and have done also in the past. They share the same interests like China and Russia in authoritarian stability. I think there is an overlapping interest, not with the EU and member states, but with Russia and China in authoritarian stability. And they depend in many ways on investment and trade with Russia and China. I think that needs to be changed, but I think that's something which also locks them in. And this is exactly the opposite EU member states are interested, which have their democratic political system, a culture of compromise and experiences in giving up sovereignty. So I think this is missing in, in, in Central Asia. So two more points and then I'm, I'm finishing. Um, strategic autonomy of the EU is a theoretical concept where we have to be honest, which never really worked. Um, uh, so in the EU, uh, it was developed by France to push back EU influence, uh, to push back US influence in Europe uh, and to strengthen the role of France in European decision making. <clears throat> With the large scale war against Ukraine, Europe had to learn that, it's, it's, that it is not sovereign with regard to its security uh, policy, and it will stay for some time, a decade, dependent on the US security and military guarantees. Even in such a time, member states are not able to agree on more sovereignty with regard to security, but also in their relations, for instance, towards China. So in the opposite, we see a renationalization of many politics, and we will see more national than communicized policy in the EU. So we have in the EU exactly the opposite trend towards more national um, uh, um, autonomy than, than, than regional, yeah? And that will weaken the strategic autonomy of the EU and strengthen the nation states with very different interests. So what I see uh, as the main trend uh, is diversification from Russia and China in Central Asia, while at the same time, the countries of the region want to benefit from both. The EU is too weak and not sufficient interested to become a major player in, the, in Central Asia. But I see in the energy and raw material field, 
and also in trade regional poten uh, potential for more cooperation. You mentioned this. I think there are more overlapping interests now. So there is this interest. But are these really the areas uh, where development comes from? Yeah, I think that's for me also the question. Should these be the areas we should invest more? Okay, these are the areas we have interest. But I think um, to, to become more competitive, I think it needs also other areas uh, where, where, where it needs more cooperation, more development, different kind of investment. I think that's really important. You mentioned this also, different kind of investment also in Central Asia. But here again, the governance system makes a problem, uh, rule of law and all these issues, which also hinder uh, exactly this kind of good investment. Uh, yeah, we can say in Central Asia. So, and I just stop here at this point. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Excellent point, Saul. Um, Iskandar, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, uh, the paper which I also read and, and, and try to help Nargis to to shape it a little bit, but uh, uh, it's in, it's interesting. It's a timely discussion. Uh, the regional integration in in the region never stopped since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Early discussions and dreaming of having a Central Asian home and Central Asian Union. All these have been transforming and changing in cooperation as well. What I could focus or a little bit highlight on the focus area, which Nargis sees as maybe emerging area for regional cooperation, which is water and energy. That have been always uh, like a critical break point in the region and everyone expected. I remember 2001 uh, paper of uh, Swiss Development Cooperation when they show uh, 25 uh, potential conflict areas on water related conflict areas in the region. And currently I can map out at least one or two, not 25. So it means that, yes, that was always a focus and it was area for disintegration, but most of the time, most of the time past the last 30 years, we see conflict and cooperation coming together on this water and energy. And I think setting up first in this institution like Interstate Commission for, to, for Water Coordination and later, these all huge institutions like International Fund for Saving RLC, all these are indications of attempts by uh, regions, countries to try work together on what issues. Yes, they had a lot of differences. They have and they will have. But most of the time, the cooperation and conflict came together. Uh, the examples and illustrations shows that uh, they overcome differences. It was difficult. It was quite challenging. Uh, uh, but I think they found a way of, of, of settling these differences in a way which may be postponing still uh, 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 serious problems, but overcoming them, not making it a regional conflict. So this is first point. Second point is I agree with Nargis that since 2016 and 17, we witnessed quite a transformation in, 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 in these areas as well. For example, if we remember uh, this whole 2000s until 2010, this, this veto by Uzbekistan, uh, any construction of upstream dams in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, and even, and even we remember uh, mentioning of using a, using a, a military force if this kind of construction was going on. Now what we see is they are declaring joint financing and actually Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan signed uh, building up this upstream uh, water, uh, energy and water systems. I think these are really uh, uh, quite uh, illustrative examples that transformations happen. I think, uh, however, however, they have, having seen these regional forces coming together and cooperation is accelerated, we see such kind of competition between regional or multilateral versus bilateral attempts. And I see a lot of uh, bilateral Tajik, Uzbek, Uzbek, Kyrgyz, Kazakh, Uzbek initiatives, which are actually a good for region overall, but they are bilateral, uh, lacking some kind of coordination mechanism, which may uh, in the future uh, bring bring some kind of competition, and and sometimes actually it may be uh, it may be harming actually regional cooperation. That's the one point which I'm observing. I think this kind of bilateralism, which is very good uh, anywhere, solving differences, but then it may not be compatible at the region level. That's the one point which I think we have to focus on on our analysis. And that and the other point is that there actually institutions exist. And I think these institutions which Nargis listed are very, very important, but they have some kind of past dependency, half-made. Is it institutions for disintegration? 
are institutions for integration. For example, ICWC had the major function of coordinating water uh, issues and plans and et cetera at the regional level. But at the same time, mainly they have been able to avoid conflicts over water, but not uh, making water project developments in the region. So that's, uh, that's kind of institutional capacity. Uh, there are reforms ongoing, you know, in the 30 years of IFAS in June, there was a big conference in, in, in Dushanbe and actually they highlighted very good serious steps towards reforming these region institutions. That the next question, how much this institutional reforms will be successful? It really will shape the future of water energy cooperation. The other issue, which is also coming in, I call a new trend and new threat, is that one is climate change. We know that climate change makes actually makes difficult uh, for the Central Asians uh, on the on the availability of water. It may reduce and they may compete. But on top of it, we know that Afghanistan is coming into the picture. You know, this Koshtepa big new canal, which they are constructing on Amudarya, actually may split Central Asian countries into two parts, yeah, upstreams and downstreams. That there is no clear division, actually. The country is trying to individually, again, individually handle this issue of Afghanistan being part of the river. So how, how this regional response to Afghanistan's uh, claim for water will be emerging. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan together, Tajikistan, or separately. That's, that's really also one trend which you, we should observe for future of the energy water cooperation. But then there is also some kind of interesting outside or so-called geopolitical um, interventions on water energy. One is uh, a reviving of the discussion to transfer water to the Central Asia from outside. Because we have uh, a lack of water, the climate change will, will, will. What about again reviving the Siberian rivers? I think that recently it's 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 again coming back, and I can hear as an ex expert that this kind of ideas of let's transfer water because Central Asia anyway cannot survive without uh, outside water. The second trend, and it's it's much more uh, visible, is energy transfers. The recent agreement between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Russia to transfer gas and oil from Russia to Central Asia, which is, which is sake of energy, energy sector is good, but from energy independence of the region, it's a quite a striking development. I think that's, uh, that's we, have to ob we have to observe. The last point, which before I uh, open the, <laughs> for, for the space for questions, is, is absence of strategic vision of all, all these developments, be it water, be it energy, how it cooperates, yes, and uh, countries are improving their relations, regional, uh, regional interaction is getting better, round table discussions are much open and friendly. However, we don't know what is the strategic vision. All this good declaration, for example, I can say uh, indeed this declaration in Cholpanata actually shapes future kind of strategy for Central Asia. But, you know, five, uh, two from, from five countries on the three agree to, to follow up. I think that that's kind of strategic shaping should happen. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the institutions and also bilateral versus multilateral trends, energy security, water security is developing. I think that there is a lot of interesting developments going on. It's, 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 I would agree with Nargi, it's more towards cooperation rather than competition, which was before. Then I should stop here. Maybe uh, if there will be follow-up questions, we'll be happy to. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, I do want to get to the questions. Uh, there, 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 people are starting to put them in the uh, in the chat in the Q and A, which is which is fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, but before that, I, I I will shamelessly abuse my prerogative as moderator. Um, Nargis, sort of like taking the taking the points that have been raised and trying to sort of boil them down, I guess to to, to one, <laughs> if it's possible. But you know, I think what I'm hearing is you know so this this the question is you know this 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 model all sounds very good. Right, but is it is it workable given the very unique circumstances of the region? Right, is it workable given the, given the alternatives that are out there? Right, um, as, as as has been mentioned, and you know, is 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 it are are good intentions enough in in the face of of, of institutional weakness and and also, uh, you know, obviously the fact that that states are still going to act and governments are still going to act in 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 their own uh, in, in their own interests. So uh, is 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 this you know, is this a fit, right? It, 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 it seems like a great idea. It seems like a, 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 a great vision, but how does this fit again, given, given the, the, the broader context and the alternatives that are available? Um, 
And I will give you one minute to answer that. Question. <laughs> well, I think. Well, <laughs> Sorry. The, well, let me talk about these two crucial questions. First one: Is it a region? <laughs> and um, I think it is a region. I uh, and uh, well, I was thinking about the. Um, the late kind of late Soviet Union when the, the process of the dissolution of the Soviet Union was taking place. And that's when the five republics started consultative meetings, you know, kind of how to deal with the dissolution. Of course, they were looking more at, at Moscow than, you know, at, the, at, the, at each other, but, but th th there was already an attempt to kind of uh, to uh, to get together and kind of they, they started seeing each other. They, they were already seeing each other sort of as a as, a, um, as a, a region. It's a region, I would say, in between. As, as I mentioned in the policy memo, uh, it cannot really go on like, you know, like like Europe, like Ukraine wants to join Europe, right? It sees itself as part of Europe. There is no uh, there is no kind of a pole that Central Asia can easily attach itself to. Okay, um, and it previously, you know, it was Russia. I don't think it's uh, it's on the agenda anymore. Right. So it is in between region, but the options are to be a fragmented region and a very weak region with uh, uh, with kind of, you know, weak together and weak separately or kind of try to work better to work better together and be a kind of a well functioning, uh, well functioning uh uh, region. Russia and China, these are major challenges, obviously, as, as you, Stefan, uh, Stefan outlined. Um, and uh, the uh, and, and I would say Russia is like short term, Russia is the, the bigger challenge. Uh, longer term, you know, China would be, a, a, you know, would be, uh, would be a bigger, bigger challenge. But at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, the kind of that gives us motivation to look elsewhere, right? Uh, and to balance them, to balance Russia and to balance uh, China with the help of other external external actors, external external powers. Yeah, um, that's why there is such a push now for deepening cooperation with the uh, with the uh, with the EU. Um, well, the, there were questions uh, from. Uh, from Yashar Sari about Turkey. Turkey is mm -hmm. also of course, exactly. that, yep. yeah. yeah. So uh so you're looking at options, you know, and uh you're kind of trying to balance uh to balance it off. Uh speaking of the um kind of I would disagree with you about the lack of uh, culture of compromises um among authoritarian states that authoritarian states are not capable uh, of sharing sovereignty. I don't think it's the case. And I think there is a culture of compromises in Central Asia, you know, just we have to have this culture of compromises. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is partial kind of uh, uh, delegation of sovereignty. Look at the, for example, your Euro, Euro, Eurasian, uh, Eurasian economic community. So, um, uh, to some extent, I, I, I agree there are limits to what can be done uh, given the uh, given the systems uh, systems we have, uh, but uh, but but I, I think the kind of there is room, yeah, um, mm -hmm. there is room for for improvement and certain things are uh, certain things are possible. Um, I, I fully agree. But with uh, Iskandar, what what he said about the kind of this bile bilateral versus multilateral, you know, forms of engagement, and it's easier to do bilateral, obviously, mm -hmm. right? But but long term, if you think where you can get eventually, yeah, you need to kind of develop these multilateral frameworks, and um, and I'm not sure we can get all five on board right mm -hmm. away. Probably not. Um, uh, but I think it's very important that that there is this Kazakhstan Uzbekistan axis at the moment, yeah. and these are the the two that can kind of pull others uh, pull others in uh, to this or that state. We need to be creative. We cannot do what Europeans did, like. But but I, that's that's why I thought the kind of the inspiration should be from there, right? But we need to create our own um, our own thing. Uh, it cannot be a copy paste of. Uh, what uh, what you did. Um, so, okay, 
I had one minute. I exceeded it definitely. Yeah, I know. <laughs> These are great questions, and I, yeah, absolutely. A lot of food for thought. So, um, maybe then turning to to the the chat. I mean, there, there. As I said, there are several. There, there are a lot of questions piling up, um, and I, you know, we'll, we'll we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. So I'm going to try to sort of maybe uh, combine a few um, into sort of uh, bigger questions. And there, there's been a, a point has been raised by by a few. Um, that there, there are perhaps, um, rather than maybe starting just with, with a, 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 a sort of a, a big kind of regional initiative on, on issues such as water management, for example, perhaps it makes sense to look at certain, um, uh, certain hubs, right, or certain examples, certain mechanisms that have been tried and, 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 uh, and tested and could perhaps be expanded. So the, the, the points are made about the, uh, the, the response to the RLC crisis. Um, there's been a suggestion of looking uh, to uh, uh, perhaps joint um, management or oversight of, of sort of key uh, infrastructural nodes in the region, places such as the Fergana Valley and so on. So I'm wondering what, you know, what do you, what do you see as, as this approach? Is there a place, is there, is there something you could point to as maybe a place to start, right, that, that could be built out in, into the kind of broader sort of regional um, approach that you're, that you're thinking about? Um, this is the, the question to Nargis. Um, but obviously to, to Iskandar um, it, it, it perhaps as well. Um, so maybe start with that. Are, are there examples, right? Are there instances, are there cases that could be used as, as useful starting points for this kind of collaboration? Maybe Iskandar, you are more qualified. <laughs> Much more qualified. Yeah, I mean, if I now uh, refer examples from outside of Central Asia, like Europe, again, I think people will see it as a difficult to achieve due to many reasons, which Nargis and also Stefan have indicated. They're actually good, good examples of within Central Asia, yeah? This 1999 uh, Asir Daria Agreement, when this finally four countries agreed the swap on energy and water, I think it short-lived, but I think it, it indicated very good potential for water energy consortium and cooperation in the region. That could be followed up, revived, and maybe fine-tuned due to growing economic and trade uh, uh, now in, in the region, which is which is ac actually accelerates this process. Other example, uh, there is a Kazakh Kyrgyz Chutalas Commission, which is long-lived, and, and of course, it's uh, it's um, most of the time donor-driven and supported by. Finally, ownership uh, went back to Kazakh and. Uh, Kyrgyz water authorities. There are many questions to settle, but I think this is also a good example how you can build water cooperation, which is uh, sharing of benefits, not, not uh, only the water. I think these are examples. I think there are many examples in the region exist. Uh, even, even this IFAS cooperation, ICWC cooperation with all its limits. Of course, there have been long ignorance of demands from upstream countries that not only irrigation, but also energy makes sense. Now, uh, I see the last uh, draft of reform proposal, which IFAS uh, recently announced. I think there they, they are a lot of good things to make sense. And it's, it's implementable. It's not nothing, nothing like something from outside of, outside of sky. And I, I fully agree with Nagi is that, that the cooperation in the region cannot be donor driven. That's very important. Because we saw how much Central Asians have been pragmatic on the cooperation. I remember many countries knocked the door to become a member of IFAS outside of Central Asia, and none of them got uh, membership. That shows that countries understand sensitivities of energy and water cooperation, and they would like to keep some kind of individual independence from others that they do not interfere in the decision making. These are really a good example, is illustration from the region which can be enhanced institutionally, capacity, and also financing. Financing. Yeah. Okay. Um, a, a, another question uh, that's come up. Uh, this sort of gets at the whole, um, the relevance, right, of regional cooperation integration towards strategic autonomy. And the question is, could not Central Asian nations pursue strategic autonomy in dispersed order? That is to say. Uh, what, what is the comparative advantage, perhaps, of, 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 this, of this model of, of pursuing uh, strategic autonomy through greater unity, through greater integration, as opposed to uh, states uh, of doing so uh, on their own individually? I think that's what we've been primarily trying to do since, uh, since you know, the beginning of independence. 
but there are limits to what you can you can do. And you know, even like Stefan discussions in Europe, why why do you need more like you know the strategic autonomy? Because Europe doesn't want to lose relevance in the world, right? Europe wants to be kind of a uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic um, actor. Uh, in its own in its own right. So yes, there are debates. You know, what's the way to kind of the right way to do it? Whether the the term the the, the term strategic autonomy is kind of captures it, uh, but uh, but Europe wants to play a role. You know, it wants to play by its own rules, right? Of course, we are you know very kind of below, uh, far from far from far from from that. But uh, but together we we can do more than uh, than a part and you know there is this, also this kind of conflict prevention uh prevention motivation that that uh, uh that should that should be there um and um dispersed as opposed to together so so basically i think that that, that uh, um yeah i i don't think dispersed is the way but at the same time uh kind of being exceedingly ambitious and uh, uh, and trying to bring everybody on board for you know kind of for an ambitious agenda might not be the kind of uh, might not be um, might not be the way, but definitely we need to do more uh, and just you know kind of getting together while you know signing these nice uh, nice papers, doing a project here, project there. That's not enough. And that will not get us far. Mm -hmm. um, and then turning to um, the EU side of things, right? So the, the EU's approach. You know, this is the, the one of the, the the ways that you try to present itself as as having a certain competitive advantage or a competitive advantage was that the, the values, right, that are represented. And there was a certain so the question here is that there was a certain normative approach, right, which the EU has taken towards the region in the past. Um, but right now, when the, the 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 focus on connectivity seems now to focus on things such as energy, uh, digital, transportation, but without these sorts of uh, more normative issues, without the the sorts of the, the the values thing, right? That that was so much a part of the rhetoric um, and and the efforts in the past. And and I, I guess what a question not least to you, but you know, uh, Stefan, I think would be interested to get your thoughts as well. So is this because this is just perceived as something that's that's no longer going to to work? It won't have a receptive audience. It's just is this being sacrificed in, in terms of pragmatics? So what what became of that whole sort of uh, uh, you know values uh, or driven or normative uh, strand of, of EU policy toward? You want to start? Yeah, Stefan, you 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 start and okay. Um... I, I just there are several other points I just and I will be just bring it bring it in and together. So I think the advantage of Central Asia is it's only five countries. Yeah. So I think that's 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 much easier than the EU, which is still growing and has really a, a decision making problem now also a voting problem also inside of the EU and how to make this this kind of decisions. And that's blocking the EU and it's in Central Asia. It's it's just five countries. Yeah, you can say it's a small region. It will not play a big role in, 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 the, in the global world. But I think in the entire region, I think it is a it is a key region. Yeah. So you can say it is really um, important to, to many other countries. Turkey was also mentioned, but then also, yeah, Europe, uh, Europe, Asia, and uh, but also in, in, in the other direction. So I think <clears throat> that's an asset. Yeah. So um, uh, but you, you only get this asset developed if you if you if you develop it together yeah uh, you need also the neighbors um, yeah so and i see here logic yeah so i don't want to to criticize this but i think that i just wanted to make uh, some points so the second point is um how to become more autonomous uh, how to become this autonomy done i think um and it's difficult in the EU. We talk a lot of about geopolitical actor, now geopolitics and geoeconomics is back and so on, but we are not ready for it as Europeans. Yeah. Um, I would say maybe Central Asian countries are more ready for it in a way that they understand what it is about. Yeah. Um, I think in Europe, we are sometimes not really understand it, but I think what I see in Europe is really the difficulties um, to, to become less dependent. And I think that will be also the challenge for Central Asia. We are dependent on, on US uh, security. We are dependent on China as a market, but also uh, with the supply chains and, and everything. And we are divided on how to deal with these actors, yeah, very much. 
in the light of uh, of the war against Ukraine, in the light of this conflict, US China, uh, where 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 Europe is now tracked in, yeah. So, and I think it's really tricky. It's not easy, and it's it's uh, and how to 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 agree on 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 this. And I just wanted to make this point. So it's it's catchy. It mm. sounds nice. But look into the details, and there is the devil. Yeah. So I think that that's right. that's the point. So and then coming to the final point on on this um, question normative approach, I think it's not going to work without a normative approach. I think mm -hmm. it's an illusion from. Uh, so you okay, you had uh, Osa von der Leyen traveling to um, to to Baku and talking only about now now um, uh, the connectivity and energy transition and so on. Mm -hmm. I think it's also about norms and standards. For, don't forget about it. We compete about norms and standards. It's also about labor standards. It's about rule of law. And I think a lot of things will not work without this. And I think that's the asset of the EU. I I, I don't think that if we're playing the mm -hmm. same game like the other the other guys, yeah, I call it like this. We can compete. I don't think so. I think I think that makes a difference. Also for the societies, that makes a difference. That brings a different quality. And if we forget about this or we think we cannot discuss this now, yeah. So I think it will just not work, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks, Nargis. Uh, over to you. And I, and I think I'm going to give uh, since uh, we are now past our uh, a lot of time. And many many thanks to all of you who have stayed on. But I think we do need to. Uh, gradually bring things to a close, um, our, our late start notwithstanding. So Nargis, I think over to you uh, to address, uh, for closing remarks, are there any final yeah, points you'd like to make? You. Any sort of uh, <laughs> dangling threads you'd like to, you'd like to tie up? Yeah. Um, then over um, to you. I want to full-heartedly support what uh, Stefan just said. Yeah. Um, I think it is a big, uh, um, it's a big strength of the EU, the kind of there is this normative uh, normative power. And it is, okay, it has a giant economic muscle, right? And it is a normative power, so it can do things. It, 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 it can do things and it will be messy and all that, but but it can, right? Um, and be welcomed in the region. And there are kind of these two extremes. One is to be like, you know, uh, super normative and, you know, and kind of uh, talk in terms of, oh, there is a dichotomy of democracies uh, versus authoritarian regimes. If you want to be a global power, you need to work with all kinds of regions, you know, uh, and regions that are not, you know, up to the highest uh, highest standards, right? So how, how do you do that without losing the credibility? Um, not only in the eyes of the Europeans, but in the eyes of the, the kind of societies, people living in the region who look up to the European Union, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and and the, the other extreme is to keep becoming like others, transactional. And, you know, Joseph Borrell said, okay, okay, it's like this, the, the world is turning more and more transactional. And it is, it is true, but, but kind of, you know, uh, finding the path <laughs> and kind of balancing, balancing these things will, will be important. And I, it, it will not be easy for the EU. It will not be easy for for Central Asian, but I think kind of it definitely should uh, um, should try. There is kind of <laughs> there is benefit in that if we want to to go up, right? Um, if the region wants to go up um, and benefit from its independence. Yeah. Okay. On on that note. Um... Huge, huge thanks to everyone. Once again, our apologies for the for the technical difficulties. But as I but as I said, I think the conversation um, was was certainly worth the wait. So thank you, uh, Nargis. Thank you, Stefan Iskandar. Uh, thank you to all all who made this possible. Aida, uh, Damir Moldir in the background, um, working working away tirelessly to keep things running. Uh, huge, huge thanks uh, to the to the to the interpreter. Um, and uh, yes, as I said, this and as as uh, I said at the outset, this is the first of what we hope will be many, many such events. So uh, please stay tuned. Uh, there, there will indeed uh, be more to come. So uh, with that, everybody, um, in, enjoy your days, your afternoons, your evenings, your nights, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.